Football League Show. They were close to the witching hour on the Football League show. No tricks, but plenty of treats. 100 goals exactly across the three divisions. And with me, a man who's ghosted past a few defenders in his time. Steve Claridge is here, casting an eye on some pretty scary defending at times. And if you've been shocked by what you've seen today, then get in touch with Lizzie with your emails and texts. Lizzie. Yes, Manish. As always, we want to hear what you've got to say. Did you have a happy Halloween or was it a horror story for your team today? You know what to do. Text us on 81111 or send us an email to footballleague at bbc.co.uk. And remember, this is the show where you can send your question in for Steve Claridge. Thanks, Lizzie. Here's what's coming up tonight. With Newcastle not playing today, West Brom can go back to the top of the championship with a win against Watford. Plenty of interest for other sides with just six points separating the top 11. In League One, Millwall shot Leeds last week. Can they do the same to high flying Colchester today? And in League Two, it was back to the future for Notts County as the division's most high profile club unveiled their new manager. Good luck, Hans. Well, we start this Halloween edition with a team whose recent record had been pretty frightening. With just one win in seven, West Brom were desperate to get their promotion bid back on track at home to Watford. The Hornets, though, hadn't lost in their last six away games. So a real test then if the Baggies were to reclaim top spot. Tony Gubber was at the Hawthorns. West Brom, the early pace setters in the championship, but no doubt their form has slipped in recent weeks, while Watford are rapidly improving. Albion had lost Yusuf Malumbo from midfield. He's out injured, and the starting 11 is still without Roman Bednar and Chris Brunt, who are named among the substitutes. So 22-year-old striker Simon Cox makes only his second league start. Watford's revival has been inspired by three youngsters on loan till January from Manchester United and Arsenal. Number five, Henry Lansbury, number 20, Tom McCleverley, and number 22, Craig Cathcart. West Brom dispossessed. Henry Lansbury has made four appearances in the Arsenal first team. Now with this loan spell at Watford, and here come West Brom. Tucking down that left side, there was an obstruction there, that'll be a free kick. And it looks like the referee wants a word with uh, Lee Hodgson. It's an early yellow card for the Watford fullback. And a free kick to the home side. Olsen, oh yes! Jonas Olsen puts West Brom ahead inside five minutes. The first threat into the Watford penalty area. Poor marking by Watford. An excellent free kick. And it got just what it deserved. A perfect header from Jonas Olsen to chalk up his third goal of the season. And he replaced Brendan Rodgers when he went to Reading from Watford. Marky Mackay had previously been a caretaker boss with Watford back in November of 2008. His mate uh, this is Olsen, the goal scorer. Looks for forward movement by Luke Moore, who's got behind Mariapa. Luke Moore goes down under the challenge of Mariapa, and it is going to be a penalty. Oh, it gets worse for Watford. The referee was a long way back. But he decided penalty. 
Luke Moore looked to have it under control. Mariapa stepped across the front of him. And the Albion striker crumbled, and it's a spot kick. It's 2-0, it's blasted in by Dorans. What a start for Albion. And having failed to score in the last two matches, they've managed two here against Watford inside the first 18 minutes, so didn't he take it well? It was right into the corner, the inside of the side netting. Goes out for a corner this time off Mattock. Well, is this going to be Watford's best moment of the first half? They could pull a goal back now. It would change the whole shape and complexion of the game. Cowie takes it. Free header. Touched over the bar for a, a goal kick. Mariapa who was on the score sheet against Sheffield Wednesday last weekend, his first goal of the season. So Albion start the second half, already two goals to the good against Watford. Luke Moore having recovered from that knock. Here's Jerome Thomas. Gets another chance to Matok, overlapping from fullback. He went out off cleverly, it's going to be an Albion corner right at the start of the second half and it was corners and set pieces where Watford looked to be struggling. There's five Albion players in the six-yard box. Olsen was one of them and it's cleared off the goal line. Here's Cox to Yara. Out to Matok. Lifted in, Luke Moore looks as if he might be held there. It's a goal kick. as well can he pull it back for somebody he plays it into the six-yard box and it's just gone wide oh what a chance Harley doing well here against Mate. that's a delicious ball right across the six-yard box just needed a touch from somebody and in the end it's the top scorer Danny Graham who's found the side netting here's Jerome Thomas Cuts inside Hudson, back to Matok, good cross, still there, over the bar. And Simon Cox kicking the woodwork in frustration. It would have been his first league goal, having scored once in a League Cup tie in eight appearances. Here's Luke Moore, and he slipped the two defenders, still on his feet, Luke Moore! Saved by Scott Loach. What a start to the second half. Still he can and it is in. 3-0. Watford might have scored themselves at one end and instantly they're punished at the other. That's the initial effort. Well saved by the Watford keeper. But more reacting quickly. And this time Loach couldn't keep it out. And it's West Brom 3, it's Watford 0, and Roberto Di Matteo a little more animated. There's Yara. Teixeira. Cox didn't win that one, but here's Teixeira reaction quickly. Chipped in, great chance, Zyberloon, has he wasted it? Oh, he's tried to tee it up. They were all too polite, it was after you, no, after you. I think they really wanted the fullback Zyberloon to score, he never has. In the end, he slid it across to Luke Moore. Here's Teixeira. Maybe it's just a matter of time, though, before Albion get there for... Oh, that's great work. Oh, that is terrific. And the crowd are on their feet because the fullback has scored. 
just one goal in an FA Cup tie before. It's his first goal in league football after the earlier chance had been wasted. And what a finish. Well, he took it like a veteran striker, didn't he? He couldn't have placed it better in the far corner. And there will not be a more popular goal in the championship this afternoon. forward by Olsen to Luke Moore it breaks kindly oh what a fifth Simon Cox the youngster with an absolute thumper and they don't come much better than that do they oh the enigmatic Roberto Di Matteo charismatic Mr Cool isn't he came back off the chest of Luke Moore and it was just too much for Scott Lokes to deal with. He got a hand on it, but the sheer power took it in. Dorrance. There's Zyberloon. To Shearer. To Graham Dorrance. Gets it into the middle. It's a chance for six, and Luke Moore has missed. But he got to it. Touched it goalwards. Disappointed to see it go the wrong side of the post. Many inches in it. And it would have been music to the ears of Simon Cox to hear the tannoy at uh, the Hawthorns announcing that he's the man of the match. No doubt a decision made by local supporters, but there are plenty of candidates for that title in this Albion side this afternoon. My money would have gone to Graham Doran's. Maybe Luke Moore. Now, Teixeira. Zyberloon has galloped forward, but he doesn't put it in front of him. But he does whip it in. Just needed a touch. It flashed across goal. Maybe his uh, most urgent intent was to get on the score sheet himself. He might have pulled that back to Zyberloon. How pleased are you with that performance? Yeah, well, it's three points at the end of the day. I'd rather win five games 1-0 than one game 5 now. That's a very pragmatic view, isn't it? Uh, that's football, you know. It's all about the results at the end of the day. But you must be thrilled with the way your team played. You didn't have Bednar on the field and Chris Brent only came on as a late substitute and you've, you've scored five. Yeah, we've got Miller out, Morrison out. So, it's, you know, it's, it's tough for us. You know, we, are, we are missing players. We are missing them players, but... Uh, we just <clears throat> we just try to stay in the mix as long as we can until everybody gets back and fit and and, uh, and then we, we will be a stronger team then. Yeah, but you're top of the league tonight. Well, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the league, you've got to be there. You've got to come with the the belief that you're going to come up here and, and win games. And um, you know, as much as we say it, um, I think watching the first five ten minutes, we didn't look as if we were going to actually believe in it in our heart. And um, after that, you've got to do the basics properly. Uh, defend, do your defending properly as a team, um, and if you do that, then you're in the game. If you don't do that, then uh, that can happen. Yeah, certainly a tough afternoon for Malcolm Mackay's Watford. What about Roberto Di Matteo? He didn't look overly impressed considering his team just put five against an informed side. Well, well, they're, they're, I mean, they're two points clear at the top. They've had, you know, haven't had, had the best of runs. I think they haven't scored in before this five out of the last seven games. He's probably thinking, you know, in all honesty, if we'd had a half decent run, you know, we could be five, six, maybe seven clear. So. Already, he's probably thinking of opportunities missed. Sure. Uh, what about West Brom's style of play? A lot's been said about when Tony Mowbray was in charge at the Hawthorns. Yeah. Roberto Di Matteo, he's, he's carried that philosophy going, hasn't he? He certainly has. I mean, I think they scored three goals from the keeper just rolling the ball out. I mean, he's a perfect example. Matey gets it, plays it into midfield, goes back to Jonas Olsen. The difference this time is that there is plan, plan B, and that is, you know, when the ball's got to go, it's got to go. The problem for Watford is that they didn't put enough pressure on the ball and if you're not going to do that, you've got to deny space behind you. And they didn't either. And that was their problem. And, and they got caught out once or twice like this. Three times the ball was rolled out from the keeper and three times West Brom went down the other end and scored goals. And that's, that's, that's what they can do. There's a balance in their play that probably there wasn't last year. 
you mentioned that actually when we were watching the game a little earlier that they're almost like the Arsenal in the Championship. They are. From the way they play their free flowing yes. football. But I suppose, like the Gunners, Absolutely. they can be guilty yes. of overcomplicating. Yes, things. I mean, we see, we see Arsenal score plenty of goals, yet there are still opportunities when you think, well, I'll tell you what, they could have yeah. got more. I mean, it's a perfect example. You've got the fullback, Zuba Loom, who, who, who pops up. You know, it has, has, a, has a great shot. So there's plenty of times to put this ball in the box, but they don't. He pops up in the middle of the Zuberloom, and it's a great chance. Brings it back on his left foot, denies the doesn't take the chance, pass it to someone else. They don't take the chance, get in a little bit of a quandary, and, and as you see, the opportunity is missed. And you know, how many times do they, do they not take the opportunity there to score? And it is, it's reminiscent of Arsenal almost, but it's still fantastic to watch. And you can't legislate for that result in terms of Watford's performance, something to have five or something nobody was expecting no. conceded. Uh, what would you do if you were Malkin Mackay? What would you do in the training? I th I, look, they've, they've come into this game off, off the back of some good results. I'm beaten in three and I don't think they've lost away in six. So put this to one side, I, give, them, give them tomorrow off, let them forget about it, come in Monday, nice and fresh and upbeat and we start again because they've had a good run. OK, well, QPR and Leicester both had the chance to muscle in on the top two last night. The hoops have been flying recently, having scored 12 goals in the last three games, while Leicester, Leicester that is, who are unbeaten in five, are clearly enjoying their return to the championship. John Rhoda describes the action. Oakley. Nielsen coming forward on this uh, near side, faced by Borrowdale. Fryatt. Gets a deflection and almost turned in. Martin Waghorn sliding in. In come Leicester again and it's the opening goal. Martin Waghorn, but it has been ruled out for offside. Waghorn making the run and he is just a fraction offside in the opinion of the assistant. Alejandro Farlin. Pushed over by Wheels. And now Tarat. Tries to find Simpson. It's Tarat. Excellent chance and an excellent opening goal. And now Tarat gets his fourth of the season and Queen's Park Rangers make the breakthrough. Look at the room that Tarat has. Not closed down. Looking for another shot. It's Tarat. Burns ball forward, finds Waghorn, little touch off for Ngessen. Faced by Ramage, and Gessen with the cross, Fry at 1-1! Matty Fryat gets his ninth of the season and brings Leicester City back on level terms. Oh, that's an appalling clearance from Cherney. Matty Fryat bearing down on goal. It's number two for Leicester. It's number two for Matty Fryat. And from 1-0 down, the Foxes are in front. You cannot give Matty Fryat an opportunity like that and expect to get away with it. Yeah, great result for Leicester, who went second overnight with that win. So we've already seen West Brom demolish Watford, but another side who could have gone top today was Middlesbrough. They were led out by their new manager, Gordon Strachan, uh, for the first time, and they welcomed struggling Plymouth Argyle. Middlesbrough said Strachan will bring some sunshine to the riverside, the welcoming words of Chief Executive Keith Lamb, who knew the team's home form had been casting a shadow on the season. But not time to don the sunglasses just yet. As strugglers Plymouth rode their luck, Strachan started to understand how Borough had lost three of their last four home games. And midway through the second half, the outlook became decidedly gloomy. David Wheater caught napping by Jamie Mackey. Argyle in front, but there was bound to be hope against a club who hadn't kept a clean sheet all season. And when Carrie Arneson bowled over Sean St Ledger, Strachan's team thought their moment had arrived. But Adam Johnson's aim was off. A defeat which saw Borough slip out of the playoff places. Oh, we had chances, yeah, but we're, we're not taking them, so there's nobody to blame for that. You know, Plymouth, referees, and it's, we've had our chances, and we had quite a few actually, but um, we never took them, so we can only blame ourselves. We've made a couple of wee changes today, eh, which worked for us, but uh, you know, every one of them did to the letter of the law what we asked them to do.
At this rate, going to games should come with a health warning. Sheffield Wednesday, another victim of the virus's sweeping football, with five players missing at Ashton Gate. No great surprise then to see Nicky Maynard take his tally for the season into double figures to put Bristol City in front. That was rough on Wednesday, who despite being reduced to what Brian Laws called Plan F in terms of team selection, fully deserved the draw secured by Luke Varney. City, the team, feeling sick at the finish. A storming encounter at the Keepmoat Stadium. The tone set in the first five minutes as a Blackpool defence which hadn't conceded for more than four and a half hours was immediately undone. Doncaster skipper Martin Woods making up for last week's penalty miss at Newcastle. Blackpool was soon back on terms. Ian Everts header, Brett Ormerog claimed the last touch. And there was a lot more excitement to come in the second half. From the whistle, Rovers wouldn't let their opponents get a kick. The passing game that's a trademark of manager Sean O'Driscoll's approach showcased superbly as Billy Sharp edged the home side back into the lead. Arsenal would have been proud of that one, but a young gunner in Blackpool's colours was also keen to show how it's done. J. Emmanuel Thomas, on loan from the Emirates, went solo for a stunning equaliser. At the very least, a fourth game unbeaten looked to be on the cards for Ian Holloway's team, but their expectations rose even higher when Ben Burgess also came up with something special. Holloway was his usual bubbly self, declaring the match brilliant entertainment, even though two points slipped away in the final minute. Doncaster draw specialists rescued their ninth of the campaign after Sharp timed his run to perfection. Preston's home form has been their Achilles heel as they try to mount a consistent push for the top six. And after three games without a league win at Deepdale, they were soon being put to the test by Crystal Palace. Alan Lee found Andy Lonergan's reactions up to the task. Preston fought back strongly. From Ross Wallace's corner, Chris Brown's header clattered the crossbar as the Londoners withstood some fierce pressure. That was a short-lived reprieve. Wallace's tremendous free kick on 35 minutes gave the home side the lead their dominance deserved. But the cheers had barely died down before Palace were level. A route one approach and a top quality finish from Darren Ambrose. The eighth goal of what looks likely to be his most prolific season ever. In the second half, a talking point. Sean Derry was judged to have handled in the box, but the linesman had seen something different to the ref. The flag already up for offside, so no Preston penalty after all. Manager Alan Irvin made no fuss about that, content that a draw was the right result, though Richard Chaplow wasn't too far from sending Palace packing with nothing to show for their day's work. Yeah, no win in four for Preston at Deep Town, normally a stronghold for them at home. Um, but what about the game at the Riverside, Steve? You can never really tell what happens when a new manager comes in like yeah. Gordon Strachan at Middlesbrough. Yeah. Terrific time to get a first clean sheet of the season for Plymouth. It was. Um, Paul Strachan said he tweaked it a little bit. I mean, I think he brought Johan Folly, Folly yeah. first game since January. So that, that was obviously a real bonus. And I think he eulogised about him after the game. And also Gordon Strachan tweaked it. And one tweaker worked and one didn't because I don't think they played as well possibly as they might have Borough. But it's always going to take time to settle in. Um, and I'm sure they'll, they'll be there or thereabouts. Now, not many spectacular goals uh, across the three divisions this afternoon. But there was one. We saw it just there, didn't we? Ross Wallace from yeah. Preston. Yeah, great uh, From free this free kick. kick. Yeah, left foot over, up and round. And it's fantastic. There's absolutely nothing the keeper to, can do, to, do, do about that. I mean, that's... That's going up and it's going round the, the wall and it's fine in the back of the net and right in the corner as well. So I know it's, it's a great game. Yeah, displays like that have given him his Scotland cap against Japan. And, and what about the, the six-goal thriller at the keep moat? Doncaster against Blackpool. Yeah. Two cracking goals from Blackpool. Yeah, right? I mean, Doncaster have been very, very good at the back, haven't they? You can see the, uh, a goal for five games. I watched this boy play, <laughs> Jay, Jay Emmanuel Thomas, for Arsenal um, youth team last year. I mean, he's huge. He's absolutely massive. And that, that was a great bit of skill. And Ben Burgess also gets in on the app with that, that lovely little sweet left foot curler. So it was going to take something to score against mm. Doncaster, and uh, there's two of the best. Yes, yeah, certainly was.
Now, it was take 15 for Ipswich Town as they tried to register their first win of the season. The championship's bottom club took on relegation rivals Derby County at Portman Road. Will it prove to be a happy Halloween for Roy Keane? For all of Roy Keane's well-documented woes, Derby's Nigel Clough arguably had the greater problems for this match. 16 players either sick or injured and only five fit for the bench. Their weakness exploited midway through the second half by David Wright. The defender, who only scored once in the whole of last season, was an unlikely hero for Ipswich, who at the 15th attempt had a sniff of that first league win. It was nerve-wracking. Paul Dickoff demonstrated Derby's desire to avoid a third straight defeat, with the Rams themselves dangerously close to the drop zone. And Ipswich do have a habit of folding in the final minute, so Portman Road was roaring as Tamas Priscom raced clear, intent on making the points safe. Stephen Bywater kept the celebrations on hold, but not for long. We were always concerned, particularly when Thomas Priskin has a great chance, one-on-one, -on -one, but the keeper to, to win the game 2-0 in the 90th minute. And, uh, and as I said, if, if we'd conceded, conceded a, an equaliser today, you know, it would have been a hard one to recover from. But we got there and we rode our luck a little bit. But I think we, we deserved that because, as I said, we should have had this victory a long time ago. If Brendan Rodgers was feeling the pressure, he was putting a brave face on it. Reading's manager needed all the friends he could get with the club becalmed in the bottom three at the start of play, off the back of four straight defeats. So the Royals' start at Coventry was barely believable. Gregor Rasiak had them in front inside the first minute. A huge boost. Coventry in trouble as they'd not managed a goal in their last three outings. And when they thought they'd finally broken that sequence 15 minutes in... The officials deemed otherwise. A good header by Freddie Eastwood, but academic. Reading earned a lot of plaudits for their performance against Leicester on Monday, but still lost. This time they had the rub of the green. Joby McEnough punished Martin Craney's poor header, and with a two-goal advantage, the visitors appeared to be in command. Back in September, though, they led 2-0 against Peterborough and still managed to lose. So there was cause for concern when Coventry reduced the deficit with 26 minutes still to play. Eastwood not to be denied that time. Reading's fears were finally put to rest by Rasiak, the pole who admitted this week he'd been very disappointed with his own form since joining the club, now has a platform to build upon. Rasiak followed up after the outstanding McEnough rattled the post. With those two firing on all cylinders, Rodgers has good reason to feel optimistic. The convincing victory lifted his team a point clear of the relegation zone. It's early in the season for six-pointers, but the Peterborough supporters and their counterparts from Barnsley were both hoping for a bit of breathing space. Their clubs bracketed together just above the bottom three going into the weekend. First blood to the home side, Darren Moore dragged down Gabriel Zakuani and referee Carl Boyson had no doubts. George Boyd rarely misses. Five in five games and ten for the season for Boyd, who's pressing his claim for a Scotland cap. But the lead was squandered inside two minutes as John Macken made the space to pick out Daniel Bogdanovic. The manner of the goal irritated posh boss Darren Ferguson, just like the second, which saw his team at sixes and sevens with Barnsley on the break. Mackham found the tiniest near post gap to plunge Peterborough into the relegation zone. I have to say it was a dubious penalty and um, I was just glad to see us get back into, uh, into the game more or less immediately and um, you know a good move, good counter attacking move, good ball into the box and a good finish. Again we've lost a goal so quickly after going in front and uh, it happened against Forrest and then we lost another sloppy second goal and the, the problem is we're not learning. As a group, we're not learning. The relationship between the managers appeared amicable enough, but when these sides met in the Carling Cup earlier in the season, it was tempestuous. Swansea had three players sent off as Scunthorpe won in extra time. A different story at Glanford Park. The Swans serenely stretched their run to nine games unbeaten, never looking back after Craig Beatty blasted them into a first-half lead. The Welsh club now has the playoff places in striking distance. On current form, they have a team to stop. Joe Murphy had to be at his best to deny Beatty a second. The win was sewn up instead by Cedric van der Hoon, a graduate of the Ajax Academy, who reportedly turned down a string of European clubs to join Swansea. Now off the mark in English football with a team in top form, 
he'll think he made the right choice. Yeah, it looks like Paolo Sosa's finally found a winning formula, but it's taken him 28 players to get to it. That's an awful lot, isn't it, at this stage of the season? Yeah, I mean, what you've got to remember is they lost their... their, their, their you know, I mean, they lost Gomez, Jordi yeah. Gomez. And their top scorer, And their top Jason scorer, Jason Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. So you've got something like 30 in the region of 35 goals taken out of your side. It's always going to take a little while, you know, to, to acclimatise yourself to a side that can that can replace them. So it's understandable in a way. Yeah, they'll be partying in East Anglia tonight, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Ipswich have got their first <laughs> win of the season. Yeah. You get the impression, though, this is where the hard work starts for Roy Keane, really. Uh, well, I mean, you, you saw the relief on his face. You could, And, and it, there was also that thought of an extra time goal. You know, he said, when Thomas Priskin missed, he said, if we conceded again, I think there might have been problems. <laughs> but no, I think we're all relieved now. They can kick on. That'll no doubt give them the confidence to go on from that. Now, I was at, um, at the Medeci on Monday to watch Reading. Uh, they had many chances it's to score. Well, they? they did, but they, yes. they couldn't get the ball into the back of the no. net. But they scored three today at Coventry. Yeah. It's very much Jackal and Hyde, isn't it? Why do you think that it is? It is. Well, I, I don't know whether or not... They, I mean, it's just that, that home form, whether they're feeling the pressure or... Might be the style of play is, you know, is, 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 is more suited to playing away from home. It's sometimes he plays a 4-3-3 or 4-5-1. You know, whether or not you actually get enough men in the box at home, uh, I, I don't know. It could be that. It could just be that they're, they're just a lack of confidence at home. And that problem spreading to Coventry. No one in five. One no. goal in the last well, four games. It wasn't that long ago. Coventry were top of the league, if I remember That's right. right. After, after the yeah. first football, it was three yeah. or four games. Three or four games time. and they were top of the league. It, uh, you, you just wonder where Coventry are. I'm not quite sure. I can't get a steer on Coventry, actually, where they should be and where they actually are yet. OK. Let's hear from Championship fans now uh, on the emails and texts front. Lizzie. Yeah, Manish, we've had loads of happy Baggies fans, as you can imagine. But Jonathan says, has anyone else noticed that the little blip we had in recent weeks started when we beat Borough 5 nil? He's a little bit worried it may happen again. Ipswich, of course, who've finally broken their run of 15 games without a win. Darren says, I'm absolutely ecstatic. It's been a long time coming. Bring on Reading. Reading is our feature game next week, so make sure you tune in. Jordan, is, uh, he, he calls himself a massive tractor boy. He says, I'm over the moon. This will be the first of many. By the way, Roy Keane said it was the worst they played in four or five games. So he obviously didn't think they did too well, but clearly happy. Now, Middlesbrough. And I know it's a bit of a poor start for Gordon Strachan, but I can't believe that some of you have already been texting in say, get Strachan out. I hope you're joking. Uh, Adam, who's a Reading fan, says, it's nice to hear the fans chanting something other than Rogers out at the end of the game. He's talking about their 3-1 win over Coventry, of course. He says, but I was also so shocked to hear the chance stracken out at the Middlesbrough game. John and Matt say a good point for Crystal Palace uh, against Preston. He said the Preston fans version of sit up of sorry sit down shut up is the best version I've ever heard. Uh, Brad says what more do Doncaster Rovers have to do to get more airtime on our show? They produce some of the best games this season. Dave is a Swansea fan. He says, glad my beloved Swansea are picking up points, but I'm still not sure about Paolo Souza. I hope you beat Cardiff next week. Finally, I've got a question for you, Steve, so listen up. Big Pete says, I must say the posh old-fashioned ground is just how football should be. We stood up singing away, having fun, but do Steve and Manish think we should bring back terracing? I don't, but what do you think? I don't think that's either. I think we're now accustomed to a little bit of comfort. I think people have got used to it now, and there's, there's no doubt there's a safety aspect. There's some painful as well. lessons in the past. Of I think so. Okay, now according to reports, South End are in real danger of going to administration, which would of course trigger an immediate 10 point penalty. So they need all the points they can get, and they met Gillingham last night, who had picked up one point from a possible 21 away from home this season. Nearly 8,000 in Roots Hall for this one. That'll please both chairman and the accountants. And they saw an even game. Gillingham had plenty of chances, not least when Simeon Jackson saw his effort blocked on the line by a quick-thinking Adam Barrett, who used his head to keep the shrimpers level. Deep into stoppage time, Southend stole the points when Lee Barnard struck again, his 13th of the season, certainly unlucky for the Jills. But Southend face a far more awkward opponent this week, a high court hearing against the tax man. Yeah, Steve, your thoughts on what's going on at Roots Hall? It's almost come out of nowhere. This we yeah, certainly sure. hope they can stave off the administrators. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of a surprise because it's, it's not one of those that has um, has been touted around very much. It's come almost, uh, you know, as you say, taken us by surprise. They have always been a club that have punched away. The last couple of years has been a little bit of a dip for them, but before that, I mean, and and. Uh, uh, Tilson, Steve Tilson, they've done extremely well. So yeah, it's a little bit of a surprise for everyone. You just keep your fingers crossed they'll get through it. I think the chairman, Ron Martin, uh, I think it is, is uh, confident they can stamp up the cash in time. Let's hope so. Now, Yeovil Town uh, had never beaten uh, Leeds, um, that is, uh, and they were going to do it today. If they were going to do it today, they needed to become the first team to win in the league at Ellen Road in 19 games. <laughs> 
Another home game and another win for table-topping Leeds, who showed last week's defeat at Millwall was no more than a blip. Opponents Yeovil, unbeaten in their last six, held firm until four minutes from the break when Bradley Johnson's cross evaded Jermaine Beckford and goalkeeper Alex McCarthy. And that's how it stayed until the 69th minute. Substitute Max Gradle sprinkled his magic to make it 2-0. Jermaine Beckford made sure that his name stays at the top of the scoring charts, latching on to Sam Votes' flick to net his 11th of the season, although Terrell Forbes won't want to see this one again. And their second 4-0 route of the week was completed when Robert Snodgrass's cross picked out Trezor Candol, who headed home six minutes from time. But Candol could now be in hot water with the FA, his emotions getting the better of him after the final whistle, lashing out at Sam Williams. A frightening few days ended with a treat for Carlisle fans. Chief Executive David Allen's resignation this week may trigger boardroom unrest at Brunton Park, but on the pitch it's two wins in a row now for the Cumbrians, who were initially aggrieved that referee Mark Haywood failed to give a penalty for this challenge on Danny Livesey. But from the resulting corner, it was Charlton's turn to complain. Dion Burton penalised for an innocuous-looking challenge. Up stepped Ian Hart against debutant loan keeper Carl Ikemi. The goalie guessed correctly, but the former Leeds man still tucked away the rebound to do his old club a favour. Next, it was Carlisle's turn to moan at the man in black. Dion Burton brought down by Graham Kavanagh, who failed in his strenuous efforts to change Mr Haywood's mind, and the Jamaican international picking himself up to dispatch the spot kick his sixth goal of the season. But the Carlisle player coach was to make amends in the second half in spectacular fashion. That long-range effort put them back in front on 63 minutes. And with seven minutes left, another long-range stunner from Kavanagh made it safe. Carlisle on the up, but just two wins in nine league games for Charlton now. Both bosses were still fuming about perceived injustices afterwards. We thought the first one was a, was a cast iron stonewall penalty, and he doesn't give that. And then five seconds later, he gives one which we don't think is a penalty. And I, I agree with him, on, you know, entirely. But we felt the first one was, so it's, it's probably evened itself out. But two wrongs don't make a right. He says he saw a push, but um, I think that's debatable. Um, but on the day, that that wasn't what's cost us the, the game. Um, but it was a strange decision. After breaking Leeds' unbeaten record last week, Millwall were looking to put a stop to Eddie Boothroyd's flying start as Colchester manager. The U's were unbeaten in nine, and they made a good start. Coyote Odijaya's chance, one of many in the early stages. And the visitors were deservedly ahead on 18 minutes, thanks to Anthony Wordsworth's deflected free kick. But Millwall refused to be beaten at home this season, and just after the hour, Alan Dunn rifled in his first goal in almost two years to pull them level. But Colchester have been one of the more consistent teams in League One this season, and nearly retook the lead in injury time when Wordsworth clattered the crossbar. The action hadn't finished. James Henry's last-minute free kick slipped through the grasp of keeper Ben Williams, treating the home fans to a third consecutive win. The MK Dons have been among the League One pace setters all season. Perhaps that's why nearly 10,000 were at Stadium MK for the visit of a Bristol Rovers side who seemed to be on the slide. But there was a long wait before the deadlock was broken. Matthias Dumbe was shoved by Steve Elliott for a penalty. And Peter Levin did the necessary with a confident spot kick, the Scots' second goal of the season. Jason Punchon's season-long loan from Plymouth has reaped a rich reward for the Dons. His second goal in as many matches straight into the top corner seemed to make the point safe in the waning moments. And despite Darrell Duffy's stoppage time goal, Rovers condemned to their fifth defeat in a row, their worst run in nearly seven years. No one's talking about Paul Ince's side, but they're quietly up to third. Every component of the game was what I wanted to see. We pressed, you know, we got tight, we won the balls at the, at the right times, in the right areas. When we won it, you know, we played some nice, good stuff, nice flying football, created ch enough chances to win two or three games. Um, and that's how we've got to be. Only one defeat in seven league games for Norwich before their trip to Stockport, who'd only won one of their last six. 
The home side nearly took the lead when Peter Thompson went through one and one. Norwich keeper Fraser Forster making an excellent save. The home of Grant Holt has been a major factor in the Canaries' surge at the table. He didn't know too much about the opening goal, not that he cared. It was his eighth in the league this season. More than a 1,000 Canaries fans made the trip to Edgeley Park and they had a second goal to cheer on 69 minutes. Chris Martin tiptoed his way into the box before being tripped. Wes Houlihan converted the penalty for his fourth league goal of the campaign. Stockport hadn't threatened much in the second half but were handed a lifeline when Carl Baker's shot deflected off Peter Thompson with eight minutes left. Thompson appeared to be in an offside position but the assistant was adamant. But any hope of a fight back disappeared as the game moved into stoppage time. Norwich sub Cody McDonald picked the pocket of Michael Rose and set up leading scorer Holt to net his sixth goal in as many games. Paul Lambert's side now to within four points of the top two. Yeah, Norwich in a rich vein of form at the minute. What about that win for Carlisle over Charlton? I mean, second win in eight games, back-to-back -back victories for Greg Abbott's side when it was all going what looked like being fairly pear-shaped in the board. Yeah, trip. yeah. I mean, it, and, and there's another they play up against a side who, you know, whose form has been poor in the last. I think one in the last six six games they've yeah. won Charlton. So, you know, Carlisle has somewhat turned the corner and. Uh, Charlton haven't yet, they're still second, and that really does look like uh, you know, the, the only spot available in the promotion race, to be fair. Yeovil's still looking for that first win yeah. over Leeds, it wasn't going to happen today. No. Uh, you made quite a brave statement while we were watching that, the title is Leeds to lose in this yeah. division. Yeah, it does, I mean, they've, they've gone and got Sam Vokes from Wolves, um, that, you know, that, that is a, that's a club flush with money, they've got a good, good manager, they have a mm. good team. If and if they'd have carried on the form, if Simon Grayson had started the season instead of halfway through it and got the amount of points he got when he was manager, they would have been promoted. So all they've got to do is replicate what they did last year. They look more than capable of doing that. Now, I know Paul Ince wasn't a happy man when the MK Dons lost to Southampton 3-1 last week, but they got back to winning ways. Uh, they've beaten Bristol Rovers 2-1 yeah. and a goal from Jason Punchin, which was quality. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Season-long loan from Plymouth, and they've done well out, actually, out of Plymouth. I mean, that's a great strike because they've got Jermaine Easter, who's their top scorer, and Jason Punchin. And they're two players who can make a real impact at that level. Yeah, it's not going well for Rovers at the minute. Now, League One's bottom club, Wickham, need to start winning, and soon, without a win in nine, Wanderers welcomed a Walsall team who'd lost their last three away games. There's no doubt Gary Waddock has had an impact since his arrival at Adams Park. Two draws in the last two indicate that, and visiting Walsall had lost their last three away from home. Scott Davis, on loan from Reading, scored twice before half-time. The first a free kick that totally bamboozled Clayton Ince in the Walsall goal. Davis doubled his personal tally before half-time. Another classy strike finishing off a flowing move as League One's bottom team dared to dream of a first victory since mid-August. But Waddock's dreamers were given a rude awakening in a disastrous second half. Steve Jones started the fight back. The Northern Ireland international continued his rich vein of form. This was his fourth goal in three games. Whatever Saddler's coach Chris Hutchings said at halftime definitely worked. This corner with just ten minutes remaining caused chaos before skipper Mark Hughes stuck it in the top corner, just like his more illustrious namesake used to do it. And if that was good, it got even better for Walsall with just three minutes left. Alex Nichols completing an unlikely comeback that left Wickham on their knees and Warwick with a lot of work to do to turn things around. Wickham's late defeat kept Tranmere off the bottom of the table, but the club's 125th birthday celebrations were ruined by a Swindon side who are now just two points off a playoff place. Billy Painter put them on course for their biggest league win of the season with this close range effort. Five minutes later, almost a carbon copy of the first, this time Painter turning in Kevin Amanqua's cross. Danny Wilson's men had to wait until after the hour for their third, Temi Obadai's cross, JP McGovern's dummy, Anthony McNamee's finish. Long throws have been a speciality at Tramere since the days of Dave Challoner. Chris Shuka met this one at the far post to make it 3-1. But Swindon's happy trip back across the Mersey was confirmed when the aptly named Simon Ferry grabbed his first professional goal.
A win at Leighton Orient would not only have given Southampton a fifth league win in a row, it would also have taken them out of the relegation zone. But that looked unlikely when Tamika Umkandawiri headed in John Melligan's cross with just over one minute on the clock. However, he paid a heavy price for his goal. A clash of heads meant he'd play no further part in the match. Andros Townsend, the lone signing from Tottenham, then did some damage down the left. His cross bouncing off Neil Trotman and into the net for a second Orient goal. That woke the Saints up and they applied relentless pressure which paid off on 74 minutes. Adam Lallana's cross driven home first time by Ricky Lambert to the delight of 3,000 travelling Southampton fans. And ten minutes later they had even more to shout about. Lambert lashing in his 11th of the season, Saints unbeaten in six, Orient happy to hang on for a point. A real treat at the seaside as Brighton and Hartlepool served up six goals at the Withdean. Adam Boyd started the scoring in an explosive first half, his 100th career goal giving Hartlepool the lead after just six minutes. Brighton had lost more home games than any other team in League Two, but they were level on 27 minutes. Liam Dickinson had two bites of the cherry to net his first goal in four matches. Twelve minutes later they were in front, 36-year-old Nicky Forster steering in his first in six games. And the goals kept on coming and Hartlepool soon hit back. Boyd profited from a defensive mix-up to tee up Andy Monkhouse who kept his composure to make it 2-2. And it got better for the travelling fans when Hartlepool regained the lead just before the break. Former Manchester United trainee Richie Jones grabbed his first of the season deep into first half injury time. The pendulum then swung back in Brighton's direction just three minutes into the second half. Nicky Forster rescuing a point for the Seagulls who move out of the relegation zone. Today we looked good going forward, but we were, were poor defensively, you know, and we kept gifting goals away. They didn't have many shots, but they seemed to score the, the ones they did have. So we've got to be, you know, stronger as, as a team. Exeter's home form might be good enough to keep them in League One this season. This was their sixth game without defeat at St James's Park, but visiting Brentford offered little by way of resistance. Six minutes gone when the Londoners failed to clear their lines from a corner and Bertie Kozic's deflected shot somehow found its way beyond Lewis Price. Exeter doubled their lead just before the break. Defender Steve Tully with his first goal in more than 100 games since returning for a second spell in Devon. If Brentford were having a bad day, then spare a thought for the referee's assistant, sent flying by a combination of Exeter's James Dunn and Brentford's Ryan Dixon. Exeter hadn't beaten Brentford in 15 league meetings, but once Craig Noon lashed this one home, that run had come to an emphatic end. A limp effort from Brentford, the Grecians back to winning ways. And this has got to be my favourite stat of the night, really. Paul Tisdale's fantastic home league record at St James's Park. He's lost 9 of 77 at Exeter. That is some record. That's, and that's including two promotions as well, yeah. isn't it? So I think, as the caption said, I think they'll, they'll, they'll stand or fall by, by their home form in this division. Uh, Gary Waddock's still looking for his first win in charge at, yes. uh, at Wickham. That was some comeback from Walsall, though. It, it was, but you, you, you've got to say, no matter what division, whatever team, you know, he'll be distraught after taking a 2 0 lead. You should never give that away. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, whoever you are, if you're 2 0 up, you should be able to see the game out. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Chris Hutchings wants his front two to show a killer instinct in Troy Deeney and Darren Byfield. <laughs> yeah. And then neither of them score and they score three. They do. He did it. Well, I mean, he's got to have a pat on the back as well because the two subs he brought on at half time, Steve Jones and Alex Nichols, yeah. both came on, both had a major impact, both scored. So he certainly did his job today. And Brighton shared three, six goals in all against Hartlepool. Yep. I still think the natives are getting a little restless down there with Russell State. They are. They? They're just above the, uh, the uh, relegation zone. And they were one of the pre-season favourites. And you know, when you look at their team and, and the players they've got available to them, it's, it's hard to think why they're down there. You're surprised to see them there, are you? I am, actually, yeah. As I say, I mean, I know, I, 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 it's not far from me. I've been down to watch them once or twice already this season. And you look at the players, there's, there's, there's some quality down there. So... You know, they, they, they were, as I say, one of the pre-season favourites, but it just hasn't worked out that way. Yeah, one win in eight, and I know Russell Slade doesn't need reminding they need to turn things around. OK, let's hear from League One fans now with Lizzie. 
Yeah, well, actually, let's talk a bit about uh, Brighton Hartlepool. Gaz, who's a Brighton fan, says, a message for Russell Slade. Can you sort out the back four, please? And uh, also, please give Craig Davis a run out because he has a point to prove with us. Now, let's talk about Leeds, though, because as always, we've had loads of Leeds fans getting in touch just to, to say how happy they are. Rory says, I've had a very happy Halloween. And we've got a question for Steve. CB says, do you think the Leeds will be in the top six in the championship if they get promoted? Um, well, they've got everything, the infrastructure, the crowd... Um, they've got some good players there now, so I, they, they, they wouldn't be far away. Whether or not they're quite at that level, I don't know. But there's a big difference between the leagues at this stage. But they, they'll certainly punch their weight, I know that. OK, thanks, Steve. Well, uh, let's talk about Southampton now, because Mike says, I want to thank Leighton Orient and their fans for a brilliant day out today. There were well over 3,000 Saints fans at Brisbane Road, a fantastic little stadium. Kenny says, please give Millwall a mention. They're playing great football and they've got loads of injuries. Now, Andy, I love this, te this text. He says he's a Swindon fan. Dynamic Danny Wilson will lead Soar Away Swindon Town to the Cherish Championship. P.S. I wore a green mankini to Tranmere and I still got frisked. What were they looking for? I've got to say that I've had uh, an email from the Shrimpers Trust. They want me to highlight to you the viewers that the club could go into administration this Wednesday I've had a few emails from you guys worried about this they say can we make sure all fans are aware of their Save Our South End campaign details on the Shrimpers Trust website and finally another question for Steve Richard says with all the billionaire owners in football at the moment do you think there'll be a championship or a league one club playing in the Champions League in 10 to 15 years time and if so who um, well, the immediate one that springs to mind, obviously, is Notts County. Notts County. I, I, think, I think if you're going to take over a club, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to look at the fan base because ultimately that determines the size of your club. Yeah. Well, as for League Two, it got underway yesterday. A second bottom, Grimsby, faced Accrington Stanley. No one has conceded more goals than Grimsby. So it was obvious then that's where the Mariners needed to tighten up. Caretaker manager Neil Woods doubtless told Grimsby's players to keep it tight early on. If he did, they didn't listen. Gary King duly beat a hapless offside trap to score his second goal in as many games. Struggling to end a run of five straight defeats, Grimsby levelled soon after. Jean-Louis Akpa Akpro hit the bar, but the persistence of Adrian Forbes gave the home side a deserved equaliser Forbes' first of the season. The visitors regained the lead midway through the second half. Tremendous pressure eventually told, and Oli Lancashire, on loan from Southampton, was forced into a handball on the goal line. Grimsby protested, but referee David Webb had no doubt about the red card, and a penalty for the visitors, dispatched with a minimum of fuss by Phil Edwards. Stanley boss John Coleman has complained about the number of late goals his side concedes, so here's another one. Five minutes into stoppage time, and veteran Irish striker Barry Conlon, fresh off his latest suspension, giving the Mariners a much-needed point. Could be precious at the end of the season. Well, as for today, it was first v third in League Two as Bournemouth welcomed Rochdale to Dean Court. The last time Rochdale fans celebrated a winning trip to the South Coast was 40 years ago. It was first against third at Dean Court, with the game given added pre-match spice with the comments of Rochdale manager Keith Hill, who accused Bournemouth of building a squad with money they don't have. The visitors took the lead just before the break. Chris O'Grady's through ball set Chris Dagnall free, and the striker made no mistake for his ninth goal of the season. Dagnall then returned the compliment 18 minutes into the second half, biding his time before setting up O'Grady to score the second, and that proved to be the start of 10 minutes to forget for the home side. Best individual goal prize went to Simon Whaley, who picked up the ball in his own half and terrorised the Bournemouth defence before picking his spot to fire past Schwan Jalal for the visitors' third. Rochdale's fourth again came from the Dagnall-O'Grady partnership as the former found space down the left to cross for the latter to steer home. The game's most unsavoury moment came with eight minutes to go. There was no need for Nathan Stanton to go lunging in on Marvin Bartley. A second red of the season, an inevitable end result, but probably not enough to ruin Keith Hill's mood with Rochdale now just two points behind the leaders. Dagenham and Redbridge were only formed in 1992 after a final merger of four East End amateur teams. Dagenham, Ilford, Leightonstone and Walthamstow Avenue, who famously in 1952 took Manchester United to a replay in the fourth round of the FA Cup. The same competition that first put Dagenham and Redbridge on the football map. 
In 2001, the part-timers came within four minutes of beating then Premier League Charlton in the third round. They then went out to Ipswich at the same stage a year later and Norwich in the fourth round 12 months after that. Around this time, they also narrowly missed out on promotion to the Football League twice. In 2002, they were pipped to the conference title on goal difference by Boston, who were subsequently found guilty of making illegal payments to players and docked points the following season. And a year later, lost the first ever conference playoff final to Doncaster on a golden goal. It was current manager John Still who masterminded Dagenham and Redbridge's eventual promotion into the league, back for his second spell in charge, having been their manager when they were formed. He took the club full-time in 2004 and took the conference title two years later, when Anwar Udin became the first Asian-English captain in the Football League. Manager John Still gave Dagenham a pre-match boost by signing a new contract which will keep him at Victoria Road until 2014. Things are also getting better for Mickey Adams and Port Vale. Unbeaten in five, they nearly took the lead when Lewis Haldane, on loan from Bristol Rovers, hit the woodwork. Dagenham are unbeaten at home, but seven minutes before half-time, Vale got the reward their efforts deserved. Haldane the provider for Louis Dodds to find the top corner, his fifth of the season. Paul Benson has scored nine times for the Daggers this season and must have thought he'd made it ten, only to see his shot palmed away by Chris Martin. Dagenham salvaged a point at Macclesfield with a last gasp equaliser last week and it was another late show here. Just two minutes left and Josh Scott with his sixth of the season, keeping Dagenham in the thick of things at the top of the table. Chesterfield have been working up ahead of promotion steam with four wins in their last five in the league and victory over Barnet would take them into the playoff positions. Jack Lester set up their winner, although his through ball should have been collected by Jake Cole, who was beaten to it by Scott Bowden to score his first of the season. Barnet were unlucky not to equalise when some neat skill created time and space for Mark Hughes to take aim, but Tommy Lee was equal to it in the Chesterfield goal. Barnet must have known they were heading for a fourth consecutive defeat on the road when Ishmael Yakubu's header was kept off the line by David Perkins. Chesterfield are up to sixth. The pre-match highlight came in the form of Miller Bear's Michael Jackson routine, but don't be fooled, this was no thriller. After a forgettable first half, Rotherham's Andy Warrington tipped Adam Hinshelwood's header over. Aldershot's Scott Donnelly went close shortly after, his free kick hitting the outside of the post. The home side had the best chance late on. Paul Warren's cross was met by Andrew Nicholas, but his effort was saved by Mikhail Jaimez Ruiz. Rotherham just one win in six, Aldershot one in seven. This one was destined to be goalless. Berry took the league's best away record to the Pirelli Stadium and they came closest to opening the scoring when Danny Racky's persistence saw the ball pop up for Ryan Lowe. His acrobatics probably deserved better. Burton were more than a match for the visitors, though, and could have snatched the win when the ball fell to Sean Harrod eight yards out. Only for the brilliance of Wayne Brown and eventually the crossbar to deny them. A point apiece, probably about right. Well, there's no doubt the performance of that roundup has got to be Rochdale's hammering of Bournemouth. 4 0. I mean, a terrific performance from Keith Hill's men. It was. I, you get the feeling, I mean, there's one or two players. Simon Whaley there, you know. Yeah. I mean, he was pulling up trees for Preston not so long was, ago. Yeah. You get the feeling they've gone to the next level, and when I mean that, I think they can get automatic promotion this time. I think they've had two successive playoff they have, uh, yeah. disappointments under him. He's done extremely well, Keith Hill, and I just think you get the feeling this might be their year. It's hard to think. It's only his third full season in management, really. It is, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure where they've ever been outside of this league. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they fare if they do get out of it. But you know, they are, even at this level, they're not one of the big hitters, so it's, it's a fantastic achievement what they've done. Now, there were a few dubious uh, red cards in the Premier League we saw earlier on Match yeah. of the Day, but there's no question about this one uh, for Rochdale's Nathan Stanton, no, is there? I think it's the second time he's been set off. Do you know what I'd like? To, I'd like a panel of ex-football players. I'll sit on it. And uh, you see that tackle, and then we see players getting booked for pushing, the, pushing people away or uh, kicking the ball away. When you see tackles like that, Nathan, 
Go and have three months off and go and have a little think about what you've just done because you could quite easily have finished that lad's that You lad's think, career. Yeah, you think he could have done some that serious is, damage. That is a ridiculous challenge. They're 4-0 they're up. He doesn't need to make that challenge. That is, that, that's thuggish behaviour. That does not need to be made. And that could have finished that lad's career. So three games is not nearly enough for a tackle like that. All right. Now, what can you say about Notts County? They've got Sven. They had Sol. Now they're going back to the future as they put their promotion bid into apparently safe hands. After their takeover by a Middle Eastern consortium, the appointment of Sven Joran Eriksson as director of football, a Sol Campbell affair, and the inevitable departure of previous manager Ian McParland, Hans Backer is the man that Notts County have chosen to realise their dream of playing in the Premier League. The 57 year old has won four league titles in Denmark managed in Austria and Greece and was Sven's assistant at Manchester City and with Mexico. He becomes the fourth member of the Swedish contingent at Meadow Lane, toured grip and fitness coach Marcus Svensson are the other two and like Sven he was a candidate for the currently vacant Swedish international job. Does this sort of draw a line under Sven's position as well because it's come up quite a lot recently that you know he wasn't happy, yeah. the North Korea job, the Swedish national job but having put somebody in who's so inextricably linked to him, presumably that now really, really ties him in. Well, I hope it, put, it draws a line under it, yeah. He's, he's a director of football and that's what he wants to be. He doesn't want to be the manager here. He wants to bring a manager in and work with him to achieve the ambitions that he's got and the, and the club's got as well. But no, he doesn't want to be manager. He's got too many other projects on the go as director of football and that, that's part of what he and I are trying to do for the long term. Can you believe the media circus that still follows you around? Still, everything you do is scrutinised so closely. Yeah, I thought uh, leaving England would be better and uh, it was good for a while in Mexico. <laughs> for one year. <laughs> but <laughs> well, we couldn't quite get out there with the cameras. <laughs> back to England. No, but it's good, it's good. And I mean, it's good every, every time... Uh, they talk about Notts County uh, in a positive way. It's not that good when they talk about it in the wrong way, which has happened, unfortunately. But I hope that's over and uh, we can concentrate on, on our football and uh, doing everything we can to leave League Two and playing League One next year. Promotion this season, without a doubt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we said that, didn't they? It's new bloke. He said this year and next year. Can't say fairer than that, can you? He's not going to say it if he's not going to do it, is he? You know what I mean? You know. I mean, the Sol Campbell affair was a bit of a circus, like, you know. <laughs> but roll on the circus, I really don't mind. I really honestly don't mind. Because it's all great publicity. So here we are, an hour before kick-off. So what's going through your mind, Hans? Uh, a little bit excited, I would say. Just had a talk with the players, a small, a short talk for five minutes uh, when they report. So... I think mostly in my mind goes how the team will play, how they will respond. So that's the excitement, I would say. Life in League Two isn't going to be easy for the newest Swede in Nottingham. A point enforced on a half hour. Hull's Jamie DeVitt was on loan at Darlington. He signed a loan deal with Shrewsbury this week, and the Irish teenager celebrated his Shrews debut with a goal. And it could have been even better in the second half for the visitors. Dean Holden's cross was flicked on by Jake Robinson, who was denied by Kasper Schmeichel. And Graham Lee's block denied Dave Hibbert, as County's unbeaten home record came under severe pressure. But the Magpies are the division's leading scorers, and Lee Hughes loves getting his goals at Meadow Lane. He had his chances too, including this header which grazed the bar. With just five minutes remaining, the home side finally levelled. A tantalising cross from Luke Rogers and skipper Lee, who doesn't get many, was left all on his own at the far post. A point rescued, perhaps, and plenty to ponder for the new gaffer. How was it? It was exciting. The atmosphere was excellent. And I must say, I, I'm not that surprised over the, um, the game uh, for League 2. I think it was a cracker. Welcome to the Football League. Is that just about right? America. It's exactly. <laughs> well done. <laughs> He's a man of many talents, is our Clem. <laughs> now, bottom of the Football League, and with only one win all season, Steve Staunton has his work cut out at Darlington. Today, they travel to a Hereford team and beaten in the last seven home games in all competitions. So, a tough afternoon in store then for Quakers fans.
Steve Staunton's Darlington continue to be cast adrift at the foot of the table and their seventh away defeat sees them slip nine points below the safety line. Hereford took the lead just five minutes before half-time when former Wolves defender Keith Lowe scored his first goal for the club courtesy of Mark Pugh's pullback. It was a day of firsts at Edgar Street as Darren Jones also broke his duck for the club when he smashed in from close range. Darlington at least showed some fight in the second half. An unloan Aston Villa striker, James Collins, netted his first ever league goal, but it proved to be too little, too late for the Quakers. So much for the form book. Torquay put an end to their 12-match winless run to inflict Northampton's first defeat under new manager Ian Sampson. The goals of Steve Guinan have helped the Cobblers build a six-match unbeaten run, and the veteran striker nearly made it three in four games with this effort. But the only goal came seven minutes from time, when a Kevin Nicholson throw caused confusion in the Cobblers' defence, and Chris Hargreaves was on hand to nod home against his former club, the Gulls' first win since mid-August. Cheltenham are in free fall at the moment and with manager Martin Allen still on gardening leave his assistant John Schofield failed to prevent the Robins making it eight games without a win Calvin Zola's enjoying his best ever season in front of goal and his hot streak continued here as he headed in his 11th goal of the season a set piece also led to Crew doubling their advantage when Stephen Schumacher found himself in pole position to drive home his third of the season Alex made the point safe midway through the second half when teenager Danny Shelley kept his call to score his first ever league goal. And the route was complete when Shelley turned provider for Zola to bundle home his 12th of the season to take him to the top of the division scoring charts. Cheltenham now just two places above the drop zone. It was Shrimps v Imps at Christie Park as Morecambe, the Football League's draw specialists, collected only their second league win of the season against a Lincoln side who struggled for goals despite Chris Sutton's presence in the dugout. Stuart Drummond's far post header on 19 minutes set the home side on their way. And Morecambe doubled their lead shortly before half-time when Phil Jevons found himself the shrimp in a Moses Swaybu Adam Watts sandwich. The referee penalised one of the Lincoln defenders, or possibly both of them. On loan, Huddersfield striker Jevons dusted himself down to send Rob Birch the wrong way from the spot for his seventh league goal of the season. With only one win in 16 matches, but no less than nine draws to their name, Morecambe probably don't know what it's like to be three goals to the good. Well, nine minutes into the second half, Paul Mullin could tell you exactly how it felt. Rene Howe scored ten goals on loan for Morecambe last season and he returned to pull one back for Lincoln with 11 minutes left. But the Imps have scored only three goals in the last eight games, not the return you'd expect from a team managed by a former England striker. And a bad day for the visitors was complete when on loan Aston Villa defender Eric Lecharge was sent off for kicking out at Lawrence Wilson. Macclesfield manager Keith Alexander will be fuming after watching his side throw away a two-goal lead at home to Bradford. Things started brightly for the Silkman, who took a fourth-minute lead when Colin Daniel, an ever-present in the town midfield this season, scored his first goal for the club. And they stretched their lead four minutes before the break when Emil Sinclair crossed for Algerian midfielder Hamza Ben Sharif to poke in from close range. But Stuart McCall's half-time team talk clearly had the desired effect as the Bantams clawed their way back. James Hansen's towering header made it 2-1. McCall combed the lower leagues to strengthen his defence in the summer. He picked up former hairdresser Steve Williams, who from the fringe of the six-yard box poked in the leveller. And the Bantams nearly snatched the win in injury time when Gareth Evans saw his deflected shot agonisingly hit the crossbar. Yeah, tough lesson for Keith Alexander's young side, but Torquay, first win in 12. Paul Buckle's going to be a relieved man tonight, isn't he?
He is. I mean, it was all. He, he knew when he took, the, you know, took them out of the Blue Square Conference that this was going to be a tough ask. It's. I mean, his, his brief will be to keep them in that league, and uh, you know that win takes them out of um, out of the relegation spots. Yeah, especially you know after a great performance in the season, as you said last time round, and that losing mentality is something they weren't perhaps used to. Yeah, I mean, he's, what, he's, what he's got to do is he's got to allow his players the chance to show that they're good enough to play at this level. You know, you give someone 10, 12 games when you've just come up, you want to see what, what, if they can carry on that feel-good factor. Obviously, he knows where they're short. I've spoke to him a couple of times this year. He knows where they're short. He knows where they need to improve. Mm. And I'm sure he's, he's fully aware what they'll need to stay in that division. After a good start for Cheltenham, it's going horribly wrong, isn't it? It is. Um, you've got to say that, that, that that club has taken more than its fair share of knocks over the last couple of years. Um, administration, relegation, um, you know, the kerfuffle with their manager being on gardening leave and now, you know, ab in absolute free fall. So, you know, it's a club that needs stabilisation at some stage. I think there might be more news from Warden Road after their cup tie against Torquay. OK, let's hear from League Two fans now. Lizzie, over to you. Well, as you'd expect, we've had plenty of very happy Rochdale fans getting in touch. David says, this is the season we're going to make it to League One. Sam says, Rochdale have always been the laughing stock of the Football League, but this year we're going to turn it around. And Billy says, Capello, get down to the Dale, because Dagnall is drumming in the goals. But Chelton fans on the other end of a 4-0 drubbing weren't very happy. Here. Simon, who calls himself depressed of the paddock, the defence was non-existent, the midfield couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag, and the manager's on gardening leave. Does anyone know where Steve Cottrell is? Well, we've got strong, strong reports that uh, Martin Allen is going to be sacked on Wednesday. But our Steve says that Steve Cottrell is desperate to get back into management. So there you go. But the Robins chairman has said that uh, he's not going to bring Cottrell back to Cheltenham. So we'll have to watch that space. Now, Rotherham, Poddington, the Millers fan, says that performance again, or against Aldershot today was diabolical. Something is not right. But this one absolutely cracked me up. Hello to Dave and uh, Dan. There you are, stuck in a hotel in Hampshire because you travelled to Aldershot today thinking that it was an away game, only to discover it was a home game. So I hope you're, hope you're not too unhappy there. Enjoy Hampshire. Uh, Kevin, who's an Imps fan, says, I feel so frustrated that Chris Sutton is being witch-hunted already. The resources he has are very limited. Uh, Vicky wants to say how amazing Shrewsbury Town's fans are. Over a 1,000 travelled to Notts County today, pleased with the point. And finally... I've got to say, we often talk about uh, dedicated football fans, but we want to talk about a dedicated engineer. Ken, we know that you're retiring today. You, you joined the BBC in 1962, 47 years ago. Good luck from all of us here at the Football League Show. Lizzie, thanks very much indeed. Well, before we go, let's see where your team stands after Saturday's results. And despite their hammering by Rochdale, Bournemouth stay top of League Two. They're on 31 points. Rochdale move up to second on 29, along with Dagenham and Redbridge. Notts County, Rotherham and Chesterfield all on 26, followed by Shrewsbury on 25. Well, at the bottom, Darlington still stuck on five points. They're now six points adrift of Grimsby. They're on 11, Torquay after that much-needed win. have got 14 points. They're in 22nd place. And Cheltenham are dropping 21st place. They're one of two sides on 15 points. Well, at the top of League One, Leeds have extended their advantage at the summit. Seven points the difference now between them and Charlton. MK Dons have gone up to third. They're on 29. Colchester down uh, to fourth place on 28 with Norwich 25. Millwall up uh, with 24 points. They're in sixth place. Well, at the wrong end, Wickham prop up the table. They're on uh, eight points and Gary Waddock still looking for his first win in charge of the club. Tramere on 10, Southampton 12. They got a good point, of course, today. And then Stockport uh, down on uh, 21st place with 14 points. Finally, to the Championship, West Brom's impressive win over Watford sees them top once again. Uh, Leicester started Saturday in second place, but they dropped down to third. Both them and Newcastle on 27 points, Cardiff on 26, Bristol City 25, Blackpool one of three sides on 24. While at the bottom, Ipswich were celebrating their first win of the season. They stay at the foot of the table, but only goal difference now separates them and Peterborough with Plymouth on 12 points in 22nd place. Right, we're back next week at a quarter past midnight on BBC One and we'll reflect on the Championship. It's FA Cup first round weekend, of course. And don't forget, there are other ways to watch all the goals again. Just press red if you're watching on satellite or cable right through till midday on Sunday. It's also on the iPlayer from Sunday morning and all week on the BBC website. Well, more football on Sunday night. Join Adrian for Match of the Day 2, 10 o'clock on 2. OK, Steve, thanks for your company this evening. Thanks to Lizzie as well, of course. Hope it's been a good weekend for your team from all of us. Good night.